my apologies for starting late and my gratitude for coming uh, to Hudson this afternoon for what will be a wonderful panel. Um, the title is, Is Lebanon Saudi Arabia's New Zone of Confrontation? And to answer that question or to challenge the thesis, however they want to do it, I have um, we're three panelists up here, all of whom have been to Hudson before. Uh, I thank Hudson for for, uh, for inviting them again. Um, my name is Lee Smith. I'm a senior fellow here. To my immediate right is Mohammed Yahya, who is a, uh, a fellow at Atlantic Council. To his right is a fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, Tony Badran. And to his right is a colleague here, Mike Duran, another senior fellow at Hudson Institute. These are all um, writers, uh, that I count on a lot to figure out what's going on in the region. They're also friends, great colleagues, um, and I thank them all for being here this afternoon, and I thank all of you for coming, and thanks again to Hudson. So if we kick it off. Mohammed, why don't you start? Uh, let's, we'll go in line. How's that? Sure. Thank you for inviting me, Lee. Um, what happened with Saudi Arabia uh, and, and Lebanon over the past uh, uh, couple of weeks is best described as a roller coaster. But better than that, I think it, it's a, an information war par excellence. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, uh, Prime Minister Saad Hariri uh, announced his resignation from Riyadh and cited uh, several reasons. One, the dysfunctionality of government in Lebanon, Hezbollah's uh, control over the political space in the country, and effective control over Lebanon in general, and he wouldn't want to be a party to that. What we saw from the other side is truly fascinating. Uh, the narrative was spun completely around this notion that he was detained and under house arrest. Nobody was interested in what he said in his speech. Nobody was interested in, in Hezbollah's um, uh, uh, infringement. No, uh, nobody was interested uh, 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 in the reasons he cited for his resignation. Uh, the idea was that uh, he was under detainment and, and the Prime Minister of Lebanon had to go back to Lebanon. This was the headline. This was the issue. Uh, the second issue was uh, there was a lot of fear-mongering about imminent strikes by Saudi Arabia or the United States or Israel on Hezbollah targets. And nobody in Saudi Arabia or Israel or uh, uh, the United States seemed to know anything about imminent strikes on Hezbollah. So these two pieces of, these two tactics were used uh, to divert attention uh, from the real crisis uh, on the ground in Lebanon, the real uh, uh, power vacuum, the real problem in governance in the country, whereby uh, Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri was acting uh, uh, as, as uh, window dressing, if you like, as, as uh, uh, <coughs> a cover for this union between uh, Aoun and Hezbollah. And this is the issue uh, uh, from my reading uh, with the Saudis. Uh, and, and with other uh, allies, traditional allies of, of uh, Prime Minister Hariri. At the end of the day, the idea that, that uh, uh, Prime Minister Hariri would act as a, as a check on Hezbollah's power in Lebanon, uh, as a counterbalance to Hezbollah's power in Lebanon, turned out to be false. That wasn't the case. Uh, Hezbollah controls uh, the military to a large extent. It controls the political process in Lebanon to a large extent. Uh, and uh, what I think the Saudis uh, were calculating is that they don't want to be part of the song and dance uh, whereby this facade of, of, uh, of uh, uh, a, a true coalition government and a consensus government uh, uh, existed in Lebanon. Uh, it wasn't something that they were willing to support. I mean, it's worth noting that, that uh, uh, support for the Lebanese army never came during uh, Prime Minister Hariri's tenure. They never sent an ambassador uh, to Lebanon during Prime Minister Hariri's tenure. Um, there's de there was definitely this... Uh, uh, idea that, that uh, in, its, in, in its configuration over the past year, uh, uh, the government in Lebanon uh, uh, was quite futile in, in pushing back against uh, Hezbollah's control over the country. I spent August and, and half of September in Lebanon, and, and the question that I would ask uh, friends in Lebanon uh, that would uh, uh, argue for uh, uh, resumed support for, for the Lebanese army is, you know, if, if Hezbollah decided tomorrow uh, to sabotage the entire political process in the country and send uh, men in black shirts into downtown Lebanon uh, uh, and cancel everything that's, that, that's uh, been happening. What would the army do? What would the, the uh, Hariri camp do? What would uh, any group in Lebanon do? And the answer is, by and large, after a lot of push and pull, is nothing. Uh, they would do nothing. And, and, and this, I think, is, is, is the essential problem. The other argument that people would put forth is, you know, uh, standing back and allowing them uh, to exercise this much uh, uh, power 
is problematic and that counterbalancing by building up the military is, is uh, important. Uh, my view on that, uh, from my experience in Lebanon, is that it's an exercise of chasing one's own tail. <coughs> Uh, Hezbollah has uh, a constant stream of logistical, political, uh, and, and uh, 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 munition support from uh, Iran via Syria and via Lebanon. If that stream isn't obstructed one way or another, then you're just uh, 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 prolonging the conflict uh, uh, on both sides. This is the main issue here, and this is, this is the issue that has to be uh, addressed. Otherwise, uh, this, this uh, pipe dream of, of uh, at best, an arms war between Hezbollah and the military, and at worst, uh, 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 the su supporting a military that's infiltrated by Hezbollah, that can be controlled by Hezbollah, uh, is, 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 I think, uh, not the best way to be looking at the issue. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. That's great. That's a very good layout for exactly what's happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to ask Tony to follow up. Tony has been, Tony has a, uh, very different take from the take that you've seen. Tony's going to ask him to address it more from what it actually looks like on the ground in Lebanon, what's, the, what's going on with the Saudi relationship. But Tony has been very um, direct in his articles and in social media explaining what's actually happening in Lebanon, counter to what a lot of the things that you're reading, uh, reading in reports or hearing people say on television. Tony? Thanks, Lee, and thanks uh, again to Hudson uh, for, for uh, inviting us and having this panel. Um, I think you asked if, if, if Lebanon is a theater in a, or that's kind of the, the question that everybody's asking. Is, is Lebanon now the next theater of this proxy war between uh, Saudi and Iran, and is the Hariri resignation uh, a sign of that? Well, the, the answer is, is, is actually no. It, it's not a theater because there is not going to be a confrontation because uh, there are no tools for this confrontation. And as uh, Muhammad was just saying, uh, the whole point of this Hariri episode is that it showed that there are no Lebanese instruments for this confrontation against Iran. It, they are, if you want to be charitable, you can call them hostages to, to Hezbollah. Uh, I'm not as charitable. I call them usually accomplices, which is another way of, of, of saying it. I mean, but ba basically, everybody has made their peace with the status quo, and they've participated in it. So that's so. In in essence, what happened now is a break. It's a break that, in fact, has been long coming. It's not. Um, it's not something that was that just happened now. It happened when Hariri made a decision to come back to the premiership of Lebanon last year. Um, it's a decision that the Saudis did not support. It was his own decision. He tried to get the Saudis to support his decision. As Muhammad noted, they didn't send an ambassador. They didn't re uh, restore aid to the LAF. They didn't, do, they didn't show any signal of, of support for his return. Their mistake was to allow it to happen at the time. So their move now to push for his resignation, if indeed that's what happened, is a year too late in a way. Because in the meantime, what Hariri and, by the way, I mean, I will say that this is not just Hariri's uh, 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 calculation. It's a calculation by uh, several of his uh, colleagues uh, in Lebanon, not of, of other parties as well. <laughs> Uh, that led to the election of Hezbollah's ally as president, that then led to uh, the creation of a cabinet that's dominated entirely by Hezbollah, to uh, judicial, administrative, security appointments that increased, in fact, cemented he Hezbollah's control over the state. That, all of that happened in this year, and that was the result of that break with Saudi Arabia. I would say that Hariri, Hariri's decision to come back already was premised on a break with Saudi Arabia. He was trying to maybe forestall it by trying to get them to support him and have it both ways, because his return to Lebanon is predicated on a deal with Hezbollah. Otherwise, it cannot happen. That's the bottom line. And so the notion that this, um, and, and by the way, had the Saudis not intervened now, I doubt very much that Hariri would have resigned. Uh, there are. Uh, not just his political career at stake, but financial considerations at stake. Um, and I think 
If anyone, therefore, believes that in this kind of context where Hezbollah's domination is so absolute and where everyone is either unwilling or worse, complicit in the, in the order that exists in Lebanon, that this has any making for uh, a proxy or a confrontation, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it doesn't, uh, it, it's, it's not going to happen. I'm not sure, I mean, I, just one last thing, because Lee mentioned something about how people are covering this uh, situation in Lebanon. And, and I, I reiterate Lee's uh, 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 assessment that, or maybe it's my assessment, that it's, it's entirely abysmal. <laughs> but um, but uh, there's, this, there's this theme, right, that, that ridicules the Saudi, um, or, or contrasts the Saudi support of their clients and allies with that of Iran, right? So that Iran has more patience and builds relationship. And, no, okay, that's not the issue. It's that the Saudis and the Iranians not only play by different rules, play a different game altogether, right? The Saudis don't clone IRGC structures in other societies that then take over by force of arms and, and so on and so forth. The Saudis play a traditional clientelist kind of game of politics. They have no such instruments or structures to, to, to export to other countries. So when people say that, when, when people make that contrast, it's because they're missing <laughs> the difference in what the subversiveness of Iranian activity with those far more benign um, uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi approaches. So in this case, when you're playing such a different game, the idea that you can kind of muster some sort of an opposition to Hezbollah that means anything inside the country based on you know, media wars or political jockeying that, as Mohammed said, can be nullified in, in, in an afternoon if Hezbollah sends its militiamen to the street, uh, then there is really no grounds for, for a confrontation at all in Lebanon. Lebanon, basically what Saudi Arabia has done now is just kind of written it off. Thank you, Tony. Um, the coverage is important, I think. Um, um, I think this is something we'll come back around to when we open up the conversation some more. But I think to understand why the coverage has been shaped the way it has, it's very, very important understanding things outside of Lebanon and things outside of Saudi Arabia, too. I just wanted to underscore, before I ask Mike to continue, I just want to underscore one thing that both Mohammed and Tony have said. And I think it, I'm going to repeat it because it bears repeating. The, the take that Saad Hariri was Saudi's man in Lebanon has not been true for several years. There's been something else that was going on there, and I think that Tony put it, put it very nicely to say, if anything, they should have stepped in a while ago to do the little bit they can do regarding that. Um, so, Mike, if you, would, uh, if, if you would kick us off, please. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, so I would add one more. I agree with, uh, with my colleagues. Uh, and I'd add one more dimension uh, to the Saudi policy, um, and that it's a, a message to Washington. <laughs> Uh, perhaps a message to Washington coordinated with elements in Washington, but a, mes mes but a, but a message to the Americans nonetheless. Um, and, and that is that it's, it's a message about Lebanon and it's a message about the region more broadly. The message about Lebanon is that there is no alternative power center to, to Hezbollah, that, that the Lebanese state is under the thumb of, of, of Hezbollah. And as long as Hariri there was there, he was sending a message, a, a signal to the outside world that there are, there's a competition going on within, w w within Lebanon between different sides, and we should back the Hariri side rather than, than, than Hezbollah. And w what the Saudis are saying correctly is that he's more a fig leaf than an alternative, uh, um, uh, a, a fig leaf, a, 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 he, he gives the impression of a democratic back and forth that doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, and that is a message to the Americans about Lebanon, but it's also a message about the, the region more broadly, uh, because what, what has happened um, under the Obama administration, and to a certain extent has continued under the Trump administration, is that the Iranians are making, uh, together with the Russians, a major power play 
uh, in the region. Their power is increasing. Um, they're advancing on the ground because they have a ground game. Um, as, as Tony said, uh, the Iranians project force beyond their, their borders by building up proxies and subverting um, existing establishments. And they have a, um, they have a, a method of kind of internally Finlandizing countries, uh, for lack of a better term, by which I mean they establish, the, through their proxies, they establish red lines within those societies to look at uh, red lines, which they force everyone else in the society to respect. So when, you say, when I say that the government is under the thumb of Hezbollah, it doesn't mean that Hezbollah is dictating every last decision. It's just made it clear that it has certain strategic interests, that Iran has certain strategic interests, that it demands that everyone else in the society respect. And if you don't respect it, then you're going to run afoul of them, and they will, uh, and they will attack you in any number of, in any number of, of different ways. Um, our response to this, um, has been to avoid, the, the United States' response to this has been to avoid direct confrontation with Iranian proxies uh, almost everywhere. Uh, and, and instead, we always, we always convince ourselves that the best way to deal with it is an indirect approach. Um, and and, and uh, American officials will even argue that the direct approach is counterproductive. There are natural antibodies to U.S. Uh, to the imposition of U.S. force in the region, um, and, and so it's better it's better to take the Iranians at an at, at an at an angle all the time. So in Iraq, we're building up the Abadi government because Abadi represents an alternative to the uh, uh, to the Hezbollah-like forces in the in the Iraqi security services that the Iranians are, 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 are building. Um, in, in Lebanon, we're building up the Lebanese armed forces because they, they supposedly represent an alternative power source to, uh, uh, to Hezbollah um, and so on. What, what you notice, though, is that w whenever there's a clash, our proxies never win. <laughs> That's the... Uh, so we can say we're building up these, al the, these alternatives, but the, the most recent example is in Kirkuk. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can describe, you can analyze what happened in Kirkuk any number of different ways, but in the end, when the dust settled, the IRGC and the Quds Force were on top, and America's proxies were, were uh, lost, lost out. Um, and that is the picture that everyone in the region has seen uh, for the longest time. So the Saudis are sending a message to the Americans that that game, that, 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 that is the nature of the game and that, it, that it's not going to work. And I think that their message has been strongly reinforced by the Israelis as well. The Israelis, I think, are seeing the same picture, <laughs> particularly with regard, to, uh, uh, with regard to Syria. Now, why are, we getting, why are we getting the alternative message in our media that the Saudis are the aggressors uh, they're the ones who are upsetting the status quo, uh, and so on. There are many different reasons for that, but I'll just name two and then pass it back to my colleagues. Um, uh, one, is, uh, one is that uh, the old Obama holdovers, uh, the, the, the Obama team is still fighting for the Obama foreign policy. Um, and the Obama team r recognizes that there is, a, to a certain extent, Trump has quietly accepted Trump has quietly accepted the, uh, uh, the Obama strategy, particularly with regard to counter ISIS, which has led to this Russian and Iranian rise in, uh, in Syria. And, it, and it's, left, it's left the recent muscle movements by the, uh, by the Iranians in Iraq un, 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 uncontested. Um, and they, rep, they, they recognize that, that Lebanon is one of those areas in which they the Obama team blessed the Iranian, uh, the, the, the Iranian position, and they don't want to see any effort to, uh, to overturn that, because the Obama conception was built on the notion that the United States and Iran share certain fundamental interests in the Middle East, including destroying uh, Sunni, uh, uh, Sunni extremism. So you're getting pushed back from, from that angle. Um, and then there's a second thing, and it's just the American domestic politics. Uh, President Trump started his trip, uh, started his uh, Middle East policy, kicked it off with a trip to Saudi Arabia. He's seen as closely associated with the Saudis, um, and so uh, a way of denigrating Trump is to is to is to suggest that that entire strategy of being close to Saudi Arabia is a uh, is a mis is a mistake. So I think those two things combined 
the uh, Obama people fighting for the, what's left of their, uh, uh, of their policy, keeping Donald Trump from overturning all, uh, his legacy in the, in the region, plus a, just a political desire to tarnish Trump, leads to this picture of the Middle East being presented in our media that is actually completely inaccurate because the aggressors in the region are the Iranians. Thanks, Mike. That's terrific because you've kind of mapped out in reverse where I want to go to. Where I want to wind up is how does what has been happening in the last couple of weeks, how does that point us to, or where does that come from what President Trump, the speech he made? We, I was here with uh, another fellow, another Hudson fellow, Mike Pregent, when President Trump decided uh, to not certify the Iran deal. And the question was at the time, what happens next? How does this unfold? And the next thing that happened was, uh, was IRGC-backed forces overrunning the KRG. That was not a good thing. So what I want to get to is, how does this fit into the larger idea that if the Trump administration can push back, if it is pushing back, if it will push back, but the place I wanted to start before that to show, again, the different, uh, the different plates that are moving is, again, this information campaign, which we saw unfold in the press, and it is how uh, Obama people and certain uh, Democratic operatives are fighting to hold on to Obama's regional realignment. So, so let, let's figure. Tony, I'm, I'm going to ask you, Tony, to, to sort of pick up on this, if you, because you know you, you, we've spoken about this a lot. Uh, you don't necessarily have to name names, but if you just say the different things, that what are the different, what are the different structures in the region? that the Obama people are trying to preserve, and how has this played out, what we saw in the last couple of weeks with Saudi and Lebanon. So maybe we'll just focus on Lebanon. What was the particular structures that were established there, whether it was with the Lebanese armed forces, whether it was the political situation, and so what are they trying to preserve? Right, so I mean, this is to follow up on what, what Mike laid out. Uh, the, the Obama administration in Lebanon um, in, when the let's let's put let's put the sort of the starting point in about 2013. It, it's a little bit before that, but let's say 2013. Why? Because this is the time when Hezbollah entered the Syrian battlefield officially, and, and uh, you know, in mass. Um, at the time, the Syrian uh, rebel forces had still control over the strip of uh, the border with Lebanon, so there was. Uh, there was a blowback. So, you know, you're coming in, you're killing Sunnis in Syria. People are going to want to kill you, too. So there were, uh, there were car bombs that started to go up in Beirut. Uh, interestingly, they were, they were not random in the sense that you would think of, let's say, uh, the kind of uh, stuff that you saw let's, in places like Iraq or something where, you know, you just had a a market and you would have mass murder of civilians. It, it was, it was a, it targeted civilian areas, but it also targeted, for instance, the Iranian embassy at one point, or, or attempted to target the Iranian embassy. Anyway, so it was, it was focused on Hezbollah, and that was the point. Uh, what was the US um, uh, policy position at the time uh, under the Obama administration? It was to uh, share intelligence via the LAF, which it knew was very close uh, with, with Hezbollah, to support, uh, uh, to, to, to help Hezbollah tackle this, this threat. So they passed along intelligence. The LAF, and in certain cases Hezbollah, or apparatuses within the LAF that are very close to Hezbollah, uh, moved against these threats and neutralized them. Within a year, this business of blowback from Syria was over. The, the predicate at the time was that, oh, we're, we're preserving Lebanon's stability. OK, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is you're also securing Hezbollah's flank and allowing it to concentrate much better consequence-free on its war effort in Syria and have the LAF be the instrument to secure that. Now, if you place that within, so the, in, after 2013, 2014, comes around. By 2015, the Obama administration altered the logic and the um, explanation for and purpose of military aid to the LAF. 
It used to be in the past that this was predicated on, uh, this was a, 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 a based on um, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701 and uh, the uh, spreading of uh, US, uh, of Lebanese um, uh, authority all, all over Lebanon and disarming or at least moving towards this, the, the disarmament of, of Hezbollah. That now was completely shoved aside. Now, every, now it became that the LAF is a partner in uh, counterterrorism, right? So this is the point where we and the Iranians are friends, right? We, have, we share the same enemy, and this is what we want to stabilize Lebanon against. So the stability becomes really the stabilization of the Hezbollah order in Lebanon. And everybody kind of focuses on this thing called, you know, Sunni jihadism, and that's it. And that's really where, that's really the enemy of all. And everybody should kind of join hands and, and focus on that. So the, the aid to the LAF, as with the counterterrorism and the counter-ISIS and counter-Sunni jihad jihadism campaign, this becomes the cover that the Obama administration used to, to again, quote uh, President Obama at the time, uh, preserve or respect Iranian equities in the region, right? So this is, this becomes, uh, Lebanon becomes a testing ground for that, right? So you, we don't want to upset the Iranians. We want to focus on the real enemy, the this, this Sunni stuff that's happening, the Sunni jihadism stuff. Uh, and our policy in Lebanon becomes focused on that. So when these guys now in the media that you mentioned, um, a lot of them are former officials in the, in the Obama administration that, that came out, or at least were speaking on background to reporters, uh, pushed that line, right? That, hey, we had preserved Lebanon stability, and now look, the Saudis, the Saudis, they're taking their sectarianism and they're messing it up. So you, you frame the Saudis in the, in the same place where you would have put the Sunni jihadism in, the same category. That's the thing that destabilizes Lebanon. And the, pres the uh, preserver of stability in Lebanon is really to maintain the Iranian order. Good. Let, let Hariri have his compromise with, with Hezbollah. Let him sit there. Good. This is excellent. This is how we share. This is how uh, everybody has to compromise and, and so on and so forth. So that becomes the, the template for how Obama really saw the region at the time in Iraq, as Michael uh, pointed out as well. So I think uh, this is why, I mean, my, to just finish on this note, this is why I've, I've described the policy, which has continued, unfortunately, uh, of the support to the LAF and of the support of the status quo that got consolidated under Obama uh, in Lebanon. This is a pro-Iran policy in Lebanon. That's the bottom line. Thanks, Sunit. Mohammed, Mike said something before. He said that one way to understand this, again, if, if we're under, let's understand what happened here the last couple of weeks, and let's understand generally that there's people say things in public, People do things in public. The Lebanese prime minister resigns from Riyadh, but there's another level of action as well, which is how different things are being messaged. Um, Mike was saying that part of this was a message that the Saudis were sending to the Trump administration, saying, you guys think this is about stability in Lebanon. It's not. It's about an Iranian, it's a, it's about an Iranian uh, structure. Do you think, or do people in Riyadh believe that Washington, that the Trump administration has now gotten this message, or what's your sense of what's your sense of what the conversations have been like the last couple of weeks? I think, I mean, the message is definitely gotten, but it remains unclear what's going to be done to push back against this. I think, uh, you know, um, Tony mentioned um, an interesting point. You said uh, everything, um, uh, everyone has made peace with the status quo in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And, and Mike, you said that uh, there are Hezbollah-like militias in Iraq, but there's also Hezbollah. You know, Hezbollah has its own regional footprint. Hezbollah is in, in, in uh, doing subversive activities in Saudi Arabia. It's in Yemen. I mean, all of the propaganda posters, almost every single one that you see used by the Houthis in Yemen, are uh, uh, designed and, and uh, 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 created in Dahia in Beirut. You know, uh, uh, there's uh, logistical support that comes from Hezbollah as Iran's proxy. Uh, there's uh, 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 training support that comes from Hezbollah, and that's different than the support that comes from the IRGC. The same thing uh, happens in Iraq. So, I mean, that raises the question, is, is Hezbollah a Lebanese problem? Is it a regional problem, just like the IRGC is? Has it become so powerful of an Iranian proxy that it's a problem in its own right? I mean, this idea of, of uh, at any cost, preserving 
uh, this status quo, this delicate status quo in Lebanon in order uh, to deal with Hezbollah as a local actor in Lebanon is one thing, it's something that we can speak about, but a whole other aspect of this problem is what Hezbollah is doing in the region. And that's something that touches other countries, that's something that affects other countries. I mean, like you mentioned, there are over a million Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon right now, and there are many people in Lebanon, um, in Lebanese society that are not Hezbollah, from other uh, constituencies in the country, uh, that uh, complain, you know, about uh, refugees uh, uh, being in Lebanon. And it's, uh, it's something that's mind-boggling, because, I mean, isn't Hezbollah Lebanese? Right. But it's, Aren't these Syrian refugees as a result partly of, of a Lebanese group? It's interesting that is, the that, way that, that, that you That is aiding Bashar al-Assad right. and slaughtering right. civilians. This is, this is the reality. Right. So what is Hezbollah? Is it a regional power? Is it a local power? And what do we do about it? Well, it's interesting when you put it in terms of, and we've spoken about this often, when you put it in terms of it being a, well, Salah Hariri talked about it in terms of a regional problem, <laughs> by which he meant, leave me alone. Yeah. Let, the, let the, the Americans go off and talk to the Iranians. Leave me alone. Leave Lebanon alone. So, I mean, the second part of your comment is the key, right? It's not just leave me alone. It's let the Saudis go talk to the Iranians. Right. That's the bottom line, right? So, because it's not, it's it's not just that the Lebanese are saying we're not capable or willing to do anything about it. It's that we all we also don't want you to do certain things about it. So it's not as though then you can escalate. <laughs> let's say whether militarily or economically, it doesn't matter. No, they want even to dictate the manner in which you resolve it. Which is only you know find your deal with the Iranians you know just do, do something about it just as long as you don't upset the status quo. But what Muhammad said is is very important and it's it's something that doesn't really get that much at attention is how Lebanon is central as a uh, uh, as an operational center for these guys in in their regional war. We're not talking just about you know, them going out to fight in all these different uh, theaters. <coughs> it's that a lot of these actors who are operating in those theaters are receiving and are based in, are receiving training or are based in Lebanon. So Lebanon itself has become, uh, and this, by the way, was the statement that the uh, interior minister of, uh, of Lebanon had said in, in, uh, a couple of years ago that Lebanon now is an exporter of destabilization to the region. So, okay, so th this is a fact, and the Lebanese is like, well, whatever it is, just please just don't, don't mess up the status quo. And, and like, it, you can't have it. You, I mean, you cannot be a state that is a driver of instability in the region and then say, Please, you know, there's nothing we can do. Please, if you could just kind of find, find whatever, go, you know, go talk to the Iranians, deal with them somewhere well, else. I want to ask Mike how important, how important, given what Tony and Mohammed have said, how important should Lebanon be for the Trump administration, or is it something where we should say, because again, in some ways, my understanding is that the Saudis have said it's not going to be one of our big theaters. For us, our big theaters are Yemen and Syria. Should the Trump administration do the same, or should the Trump administration have some sort of hand on Lebanon? Um, I, I, I think the starting point for the Trump administration um, is with two principles. One is that uh, you can't have a regional strategy that is coherent if it, if it isn't across all theaters. So, and the only, the only one that makes any sense to me is that we should be pushing back against Iran in, in all theaters, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Bahrain, et cetera. Um, and the, the second principle is that Iran, is in a con Iran, together with Russia, is in a contest with the United States. Part of, uh, Tony did a nice job of explaining how the, the region looks from President Obama's point of view. And when I say President Obama, and a significant number of national security officials who continue to work in the, uh, you know, in the in the in the, in the government and, and inform the media. What he didn't say, though, is that they they also tend to read regional politics as Saudi Arabia versus Iran, mm -hmm. right? And 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 Saudi Arabia is the as as Tony mentioned, that's the sectarian actor, mm -hmm. and Iran is somehow not sectarian. 
President Obama himself said this in a number of interviews, that the Iranians are much more open, uh, and, and Shiite Islam perhaps, much more open to um, coexistence with, uh, uh, with, with, with other religious trends and with other peoples than, 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 than the Saudis are. It's nonsense. It's total nonsense. If you look at what the, what the Iranians are doing on the ground in Syria, that is, uh, that is ethnic cleansing, religio-ethnic uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of the worst possible kind, right? It's what they're doing in Iraq as well. So um, we have to understand that we are the target. They have an indirect policy against us because we're a superpower. So, what do you mean by that? If you can just explain, them. they're destroying our proxies. They're okay. destroying our allies, and they go at us that way. And they they send Zarif they, they send Zarif to to say to John Kerry or to say uh, uh, to, to, to to Tillerson and that oh we have common interests, right? You right. we are your best ally against Sunni extremism uh, and, and so on and so forth, when on the ground they under, they're undercutting all of our friends, right? So we see it in terms of, or many of our policymakers see it in terms of a sectarian struggle between Shia and Sunni, mm -hmm. Persians and Arabs, Saudi and Iran, and you're saying, actually it's not really about the Saudis so much, it's more about our security, it's our about us. It's about us, we are the, it's the American dominated order that they are seeking to destroy. And they say it openly all the time, if you listen to them. Like they, they don't hide it. They, they don't hide it, except when they, there's, something, there's, there's something pernicious in diplomatic culture, or, or in, in, with two things. One is that what, you, what, you dis, what, what is said behind, basically what is said behind closed doors between diplomats seems truer than what you can read in the newspaper. But if you just read the if you read the speeches of, of, of Ali Khamenei, you can see that he's saying we're 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 out to undermine the United States, right? So uh, and that's why they went. That's one of the reasons why they had many reasons, but one of the reasons they went to Kirkuk right after Trump's speech right. was to send the message that yeah, Trump says he's going to push back against us. No, because on the ground we've got a ground game. The 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 the, the Americans don't. So in answer to your question, which I didn't answer, no, no, it was, uh, <laughs> the. Uh, uh, in, answer, in answer to your question, um, Lebanon is important to the United States and pushing back against it, but it's not necessarily the most important place and, 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 and not necessarily the easiest. I mean, um, uh, I, I, I understand when, when Tony says that, you know, that the Lebanese are saying, don't disturb us and so on, um, uh, that that's a self-serving argument to a certain extent. But, it's not a completely nonsensical, uh, nonsensical argument. Destabilizing Lebanon is not necessarily the best way for us to address our problem. I think the easiest way for us to address our problem is in Syria. That's where there's a war. That's where they have their soldiers on the uh, uh, Hezbollah and Iran. They have their, their soldiers uh, uh, on the ground. Um, and that's where the contest for regional mastery is uh, that is the, the, the center of gravity of the contest for regional, gra uh, re regional mastery. And so I, I think we should be pushing back against the Iranians all across the board. But if, we wanna, if, if, if we're looking for a place for us to make a major, um, uh, a, a major stand against them, define major however you want, it's in Syria. Mohammed, you were going to... Yeah, I just I have to agree with what uh, Mike said about the problem with the way we're looking at this uh, regional uh, power struggle between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's not a regional power struggle between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You know, the way it's been described over the past several years is that, you know, the United States and Western actors are removed an isolated third party in this 1,400-year-old struggle between the Sunnis yeah. and the Shiites. This is not the case. Right. You know, if you were to go to Iran and ask them what the main national security threat to the Islamic Republic is, they'll tell you it's this country. If you go to Saudi Arabia and ask the same question, they'll invariably tell you it's Iran. This is the problem uh, as it exists. And you mentioned uh, uh, Iranian support for, for proxies on the ground. Iranian, uh, Iranians have supported uh, Al-Qaeda, Hikmatyar, Taliban extensively. And this is before the recent uh, Abbottabad files. This was well established and well documented long before that. Uh, and, they, and they supported them in very specific uh, situations when, when the goal was to undermine the United States and Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a microcosm well, of the real th struggle. This is interesting. Not Mike not is not talking about the theaters, and now you are too, because I wanted to ask you, because nearly at the same time, uh, when Saad came to Riyadh and resigned, uh, Iranian-backed Houthi uh, rebels fired an Iranian missile at the airport in Riyadh. 
So this is another theater. Can you talk about, I mean, Definitely. can you talk about why you think that this happened at the same time? I mean, I, I, I would put it, I'd put it in the same uh, column as Mike saying like, well, look, this was part of what the KRG stuff was. Is this the same thing? The Iranians are pushing back on American allies. I think so. I think so. Uh, so just in terms of, of, of the facts behind uh, the ballistic missiles in Yemen, I mean, the way they're brought in is that they're brought in pieces from Iran through Hodeida port most of the time and then assembled by IRGC, Iranian IRGC advisors in Yemen. So these aren't uh, 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 Yemeni-made missiles or... or uh, uh, but what happens is, you know, these ballistic missiles uh, are very sensitive politically. I, 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 they don't get fired uh, without IRGC green lights. I mean, the IRGC is very careful when it's uh, 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 sending this type of uh, 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 technology and this type of expertise to its proxies. Uh, so uh, we don't have all, all of uh, uh, the details, but this was an Iranian-made uh, uh, missile, and it was uh, uh, fired... Uh, from Yemen under the supervision of uh, IRGC uh, uh, advisors that have been in the country for, for several years. And it's, uh, uh, it could be very similar to what you described in Kirkuk. Uh, just real quick, uh, yeah. so, because Mike said something about you know, Lebanon as a theater and whether for the, U for the United States. <coughs> I'm, okay, fine. I mean, it doesn't have to be a theater. I'm not suggesting that we make it a theater. I'm not sure you can make it a theater. In fact, my argument has been that it Yeah, right. There's no instruments for it to, right. Okay. What I'm saying is, what, what we're doing now, it's not, you know, the decision isn't between, you know, making a theater versus not making it. Right now, the United States is supporting an order in Lebanon, right? It is supporting an Iranian order in Lebanon. That's what the policy does. My point is, can we stop? <laughs> yeah. Please. Well, do you do you want do you want to talk? Do you want to address something I know that you've written about uh, and you've spoken about? You're talking about supporting the Iranian or the Iranian order in Lebanon. Do you want to talk about? Let's talk for a second about American policies, how we stop them. <laughs> so let's start with the funding of the Lebanese armed forces. How's that? Right. I mean, ex I mean, this is. People say, well, you know, you're supporting an alternative power center, but it. The Lebanese Armed Forces doesn't even qualify <laughs> as that. Lebanese Armed Forces, leaving aside all the sectarian, you know, colorfulness that, uh, you know, that exists in the LAF, which is a reflection of the Lebanese mosaic and all of that. Yeah, okay. Which, by the way, is a great th way of saying that the LAF doesn't do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but leave that aside. The LAF, the LAF acts on the directives, or should act on the directives of the Lebanese government, except, of course, when the Lebanese government asked it to move against Hezbollah in 2008, in which it told it uh, you know, to, to, to take a hike. But uh, in theory, that's what the LAF does. It acts on the directives of the political uh, authorities. The political authorities are dominated by Hezbollah and its allies and it's reinforced by Hezbollah's military power, which makes sure that its dominance is total and consistent. Therefore, your, the concept that this instrument is going to move against Hezbollah is paradoxical on its own terms. It, does, it will not happen. It's never going to happen. It, it, second, it does happen. The army will fall apart. If, by you know, miracle, somehow there is a move against Hezbollah, the army will split along sectarian lines. It is not an instrument. It that, is, that is a very interesting idea, and you put it very well. The idea, like, wait a second, the army acts at the behest of a government. Yes. And if the, go the idea that you can circumvent this Hezbollah-controlled government right. and go to the army and say, ignore your government. Right. Um, un unless, you know, we have some idea about putting a junta in power right. in Lebanon, which I, last I looked, I don't think that's the policy. But, the, I, you know, the notion that the LAF is this kind of instrument is is completely nonsensical. Now, I proposed uh, in an article, OK, everybody's wedded to this business of the LAF and supporting it. Can we at least, is it, is it too much to ask the Lebanese uh, to, uh, to abide by a timetable and a set of benchmarks for this 12-year-old policy that has, whose objective remains ambiguous, whose you know, benchmarks as to whether it's ever been achieved, anything of what it set out to achieve uh, has been met. Uh, when do we see that this, 
you know, ultimately we want to undermine Hezbollah in Lebanon by supporting the LAF. Okay, can you guide us as to how and by what year we might start seeing some dividends in this and signs in this in this direction? No, it's a policy based on hope, or as I called it, poetry. I mean, it's 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 a it's like yeah, we're going to support the LAF because by supporting state institutions, we create an alternative to Hezbollah and weaken Hezbollah. It's very mm-hmm. nice. What does that actually mean? Are you saying you want a policy without hope? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I want a hopeless policy. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's just nobody gives you, but that's, that's the strange thing, right? Because that's not usually how policy is supposed to be made, right? It's supposed to be very concrete with very concrete objectives and timelines and everything. When you come to Lebanon, to the question of Lebanon, and ask, okay, what is this stuff that you're saying? What does it actually mean? How does it play out? How do we move from phase A to phase uh, C? What happens in phase B, in the middle, uh, that connects phase A to phase C? How do we move from supporting the LAF and the state to disarming Hezbollah or weakening Hezbollah? Where is that missing link? Everybody says, well, ultimately, hopefully, it's like, okay, this is, not, this, is not a, this is not a serious policy. I mean, have you ever seen anybody discuss this mechanism in the middle ever for the last 12 years? Not once. Um, Mike has said that he believes at the center of gravity for the Trump administration to push back on um, Iran is Syria. Um, Mohammed, do you think it's Syria as well? Or do you think that the, I believe that the Saudis have it prioritized a little differently? Yemen is on, <laughs> is on the border. What's the, but again, I, I am curious, I'm curious to get some sense of how, how American allies are speaking with the Trump administration about this. So if you can give us a little insight into Iran, and there's another, but there's another issue after you that I want to ask Mike to get to, because of course one of the things that happened as we spoke about with the information campaign, the Israelis also got dragged into this. And I mean, the, the fantastical scenarios <laughs> that were floating around Washington. Oh, well, now the Saudis have, have gotten rid of Saad, so it's an uh, open runway. Now the Israelis can bomb them. They have, they've gotten the sign-off. Or who knows, maybe the Saudis themselves will work at a deal with the Russians, and they will bomb Dahi. It's going to be just a spectacularly scary thing. So if we can start first with you, know, with you what is the Saudi priority? And then, Mike, yeah, I want to ask you how this looks from our other allies, in particular Israel-related, what's happened in the last couple of weeks. You know, let's look specifically at Lebanon. The solution for, for, for Lebanon, uh, to a great extent, is, is uh, solving the Syria uh, problem. As long as uh, uh, Hezbollah has access to uh, ammunition, to political uh, and logistical uh, support uh, from the Iranians uh, via Iraq and, and Syria, the, the support comes through trucks through the Syrian border. If the Lebanese state could control its borders, control what kind of guns are going to this militia down south, and uh, what kind of support, uh, financial or otherwise, is going to these uh, uh, to this militia? Then I would I would support an idea of you know uh, uh, supporting the LAF. Then then it makes sense to alter the balance of power, to alter the uh, monopoly on the use of force in Lebanon uh, in such a way uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know power can be restored to the government. But that's not what's happening right now. And, and the reason it's not happening right now is because of the chaos that's happening uh, uh, across the border in Syria. Chaos that is is made possible by Hezbollah's uh, support uh, of the Assad regime. I mean, the Russians are, 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 are providing air cover for the regime. But on the ground, it's primarily Hezbollah expertise, Hezbollah advisors, Hezbollah leaders, along with IRGC leaders, controlling uh, a medley of militias. Can I ask, you, can I ask you, and Tony might have some sense of this too. <clears throat> so if, if the United States stops funding the LAF, how constrained is the LAF then in its logistical support for Hezbollah? How much is it able to cover its flank as Hezbollah is uh, fighting in Syria. Does it affect it? I don't think it's going to be that. I mean, look, you know, they, they used everything that we've given them, especially along the border, in fighting. But the problem is that the, at this stage, the, the, even before, the nature of the threat that they were facing I mean, has been so exaggerated. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, OK, look. ISIS wasn't about to establish a second caliphate in Tripoli, all right? It was just not. It was nowhere near that, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, two, three hundred guys holed up in the uh, uh, outback uh, of the Lebanese border uh, with Syria in, in caves 
are not about to come in and take over Tripoli and establish an emirate in Lebanon. It was, it was never going to happen. So the idea is, okay, well, you know, you have threats of bombings, and okay, um, so does France. I mean, you know, so does you know, so does the United States for that matter. Um, they 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 are capable of of I think handling. I mean, the idea was to help them in an actual battle situation to use precise munitions, to use tactics, intelligence, etc., to help them in an actual. Uh, uh, battle uh, sort of uh, situation. This is, uh, it's not, there is no such front anymore in Lebanon for these guys to fight. The only thing that they have now are these Palestinian camps, which by the way are, I mean, the security on those things is tighter than a drum. I mean, it's just, the LAF has those things surrounded and infiltrated and, you know, so it's, I don't think there is any serious in, in the way that people have described it in terms of, threat of, of a threat right. to, right. To, to Lebanon. So, I, you know, as far as Hezbollah is concerned... By, by, by that, you mean, again, coming back to the idea of a sectarian conflict in Lebanon. Yeah, no, no. The, the, Sunni jihadi takeover. Right. Yeah, no, it's just... Or even a Sunni Shia war. It was never... It was, it was never in the cards. It was never an, a serious option for anybody. It's, just, it doesn't, it's not there. These guys are so small in Le- you know the the the, um, the jihadi uh, Islamists in Lebanon. Right. What they represent is so tiny and is completely uh, lacking in any political constitu- constituency of, or cover. There is nobody in the Lebanese system who would say, "No, you should protect these guys." If that right. kind of thing arises. Everybody, it's the, it's the easy consensus. And that's why the United States, you know, oh, my God, the LAF is such a fantastic partner against these guys. Yes, because it's politically cost-free. Yeah. <laughs> they can move against them. I, I ask you, for instance, by contract, Hezbollah is not the only militia fight, Lebanese militia fighting in Syria. There are at least three, if not more, other militias, one with the Syrian Socialist National, Syrian Social Nationalist Party, number one, um, um, Hezbollah's resistance brigades, which are Sunni guys as well that, that Hezbollah uh, uses. And uh, I forgot. We uh, uh, are that's right. Uh, the Saraya, Saraya al Tawheed, I think it's called. What is it called? Something. Um, anyway, so at, at least, so a Druze militia, SSNP militia, and the Hezbollah resistance brigade, right? These guys aren't, you know, they're not the Wehrmacht. Okay, they're not in the tens of thousands. Uh, okay, they're very limited amounts of people, very limited amounts of ammunition. Okay, can the LAF move against a single one of these people to, to disarm them or to block their movement in and out of Syria? Not a chance. Not in chance. Not a chance. Jihadis all day long. It's the easiest thing to do. Um, Mike, do you want to? So the, yeah, again, if you can just give a, about uh, the Israelis, just the, remember how the whole thing, it's, it's not really so much about what the Israelis are saying, but why were the Israelis included in this information? I think it's uh, interesting, campaign. though, to look at it from the Israeli point okay. of view, because the, because the Israelis uh, and the Saudis are reading the same, uh, the same map, Okay. Uh, because the Israelis, I mean, the Israelis have three red, red lines in Syria, and no use of Syrian territory for cross-border raids into Israel. Um, no transfer of strategic weaponry from uh, from Syria, uh, from the Syrian government or Iran to uh, to Hezbollah, and um, and no IRGC presence on the Israeli border. Um, and as the Russians and the Iranians are more and more successful in in Syria, the Israelis can see this this uh, um, uh, Hezbollah and Iran moving closer and closer to the. Uh, uh, to, to the Golan, um, and the re, the the pullback by the United States under the Obama administration um, gave the Israelis no recourse other than to take military action occasionally in support of their red lines, but also to go to Tehran, uh, to um, uh, Moscow, and to negotiate with Putin, and they developed a very interesting uh, relationship with with Putin, whereby they go and they tell Putin what their red lines are, uh, and they explain to Putin that they're going to continue to take action on the, on, on, um, in, in, to protect their, um, uh, their red lines. Um, 
and they will do it even when the even if the if the things that they want to prevent are happening under a russian umbrella um, and it's an interesting kind of give and take they don't they're not negotiating with i mean they are negotiating but they're not formally negotiating with 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 putin they don't they don't ask his permission and they don't ask him to do anything they inform him of what their of of what their red lines are and then they and then they and then they take action and their their theory is that this will create some tension between the Iranians and the Russians because it's embarrassing for the Russians to have the Israelis come in and and take out targets under the Russian um uh, under the Russian defense uh umbrella and they're hoping that this friction that that's caused between the Russians and the Iranians will then lead the Russians to uh uh to restrain the Iranians to a certain extent. Um the Americans are coming in with a similar idea, I think. I don't have a great uh clarity which is, what, this will which is well, I think I think the Americans are a little bit I suspect and I'm I'm reading tea leaves here. I don't Donald Trump isn't talking to me about how he <laughs> understands these things, right? But I suspect that the president believes he can through diplomatic means separate the Russians from the Iranians which i think is impossible because the Russians and the Iranians have a vital interest in propping up the 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 Assad regime and exp- expanding its power and they are mutually dependent on each other they have a they have a um a division of labor whereby Hezbollah and uh, Iranian proxies are and Iranians themselves are the the ground forces and the Russians are the are 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 the are, are the air force so the Israelis are thinking in terms of friction and the Americans are are thinking in terms of separating what the Americans are not doing and this is what's upsetting to the Israelis is the Americans are not making Israeli concerns Israeli red lines part of American policy right F- so there's no formal agreement with the Russians that the Russians will keep the Iranians uh, uh, the Iranians out so the Israelis are looking still looking at the progress of the of the um of the uh, uh of the Iranians toward the Golan right and that and and the and and the israelis know that if they uh, the israelis are increasingly worried that they're actually going to have to intervene in syria so they have not wanted to do all along so that and that could easily that could easily turn into a full blown war in which in which case it would move to lebanon right, right? cuz lebanon cuz hezbollah has 100,000 rockets and missiles that can hit major israeli cities well this is uh, so you, Uh, Tony I want you to guys just want to ask something and maybe mm-hmm. this will inform your answer as well which is it occurred to me Mike when you were talking about Israeli red lines about transfer of strategic weapons at what point is it not just the transfer is what as at what point will it become wait a second those weapons alone existing in Syria are the problem the problem is not them going across right. the border to Lebanon anymore the fact that they are in Syria is now a problem right. That, was I mean, that, that I thought that's part of what you were going to Well that's the Israeli position right if you if you look at uh Netanyahu's comment following Hariri's resignation right nothing to do with Lebanon it, because it's not news for the Israelis that Lebanon is Hezbollah I mean they, that's their position since at least 2009 I mean right so it's not like anything new um what he said is it was a call to action to the americans as mike uh, was, say, was saying earlier about syria he said to prevent uh, the rep- the replication of this reality that exists already in lebanon in syria which is the entrenchment of iranian power in syria that's where the israelis are are focused now because you see um mike used a, a very accurate and useful term ground game right so we're talking narratives and indirect clever ploys of how to in the long term hopefully yeah. undermine the Iranians because we've actually bought this nonsense that the Iranians have patience and that's what they do and so we're going to have to replicate it and we've carpets right exactly so we have to replicate it somehow in the meantime they're lapping up real estate right so at some point your options as to what you need to do to stop it you need you can't you know fight from the ether you have to fight from a physical space and they are lapping up the physical space and now that physical space is coming dangerously close to where others who don't have the luxury of distance right where this is going to lead to something and 5 kilometers and 10 kilometers in keeping the you know this negotiation 
that's nice. Nobody cares. The point is what happens on the 15th kilometer where there's an Iranian missile base. Right. And so on. That's what I mean yeah. about, uh, you know, at what point does that change? It's not just the transfer, it's the existence. That's of right. So that's where, the, that's where another, Israeli messaging another, is. Another question I have for this, and then I want to open it up for, to, for a few questions. And again, I think we'll run about five minutes late since we started about five minutes late. But for both Mike and, for both Mike and Tony, well, Mike, actually, I'm going to ask you this. So you were speaking before about the, the well-known deconfliction mechanism where the Israelis and the Russians talk about not hitting each other's planes in the sky, and uh, Netanyahu goes and talks to Putin about these different things. And this is why both the, uh, partly why both the Israelis and the Americans think there's some friction there. I've always wondered, what are the Russians selling the other side? By which I mean, we know that everyone talks about, well, the Israelis have no problem going in, going in and hitting stuff, and the Russians don't stop them. How do we know? that the Russians aren't warning the Iranians at different times, because it would be a hard position, right? It's like, yeah, we're just letting them hit your stuff at any time. How do we know they're not selling stuff to the Iranians as well? Do you know, um, what, I, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, um, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer. Because the Israelis aren't going to talk about access. it. The Russians aren't going to talk about it. No, and, 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 and I don't have any access to classified intelligence that might tell us some of the what we think is going on between the Iranians and the Russians. I can guess, and... and, and uh, What's your guess? My, my guess is that, that a fight with Israel right now is clearly not in the, the Iranian interest. And, um, and so they, the, the Iranians and the Russians' priorities, you know, is securing Damascus and, uh, and, and the north and so on. Um, and, and, and so the, the Iranians, for the moment, can bide their time. But sooner or later, I, 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 I operate under two assumptions. One, assumption number one, as I said, is that you cannot separate the Russians and the Iranians. They have the same strategic interests. They may have tactical differences, right? I like to call them Siamese twins that share the same organs, right? You know, they, 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 may, they may fight with each other all day long, right? One, one wants to go out on one date and the other one doesn't and so on. But, uh, but that friction doesn't, doesn't mean that in the end they don't, they don't share certain basic interests. They're not going to separate from each other in, 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 any, in, in, in any, any kind of meaningful time for, a, for an American strategy. That's principle number one. But principle number two is, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm seeming to con contradict myself, but I'm not. The, uh, so any, any, any apparent contradiction here is... Oh, you you is will resolve that, it in the I will resolve. In the right? Is that the Iranians have an interest, ultimately, in showing the world that you cannot control them through Moscow, right? They have an interest in showing this. They want, Iran wants, if you want something in Syria, Iran wants you to come to Tehran, right? Iran doesn't want you to go to Moscow. If, they, if, if, if the world starts thinking that you go to Moscow to get Tehran, that's very bad for them. So they're going to want to differentiate themselves at a certain point. Right now that's is not the time, yeah. because right now uh, uh, an, an Israeli-Iranian war in Syria and in Lebanon and so on is not going to advance their interest of... of Do you think that drives them to war eventually, though? I think I, 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 I think that if we think that if, if, if that if we think we're going to keep the Iranians out of southern Syria by negotiating sweetly with Putin and explaining to him that it's not in his interest, <laughs> right? We're selling ourselves the same kind of uh, snake oil that said the LAF is going to push back against Lebanon and 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 uh, and Abadi is going to reverse the Iranian. Uh, Right, oh. we it, it it belongs the the Putin is the answer. You see, here's here's what happens. Right, American officials are not idiots, and they look at the fact that the they, they look at the fact that the Iranians are growing ever stronger in Syria, and then they look at the appetite of the American public for a muscle <coughs> movement by the Americans in by the American forces in Syria, and then they talk to the European allies, right, who all want to give Iran a pass. And they look at the pain of the lift, right, mm. of, of actually doing something against Iran and, uh, on, on the ground with the American public and with the, uh, and with the um, Europeans. And then they start coming up with really, as, as Tony said, really clever, ethereal, hopeful policy. Poetry. Poetry, yes. right, which sounds great, right? It sounds great. And uh, when, when, you, when you tell President Trump, you know, 
President Trump, the Iranians are getting a lot stronger, but yeah, or, 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 or a great, a better example, because we saw it in public. When Putin and the Iranians invaded Syria, right, or uh, increased their, increased their, uh, their operations in, 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 uh, uh, in Syria exponentially after the nuclear, after, after the <laughs> nuclear deal in 2015, what did President Obama say? Oh, they're in a quagmire. <laughs> you know, that was, this is the dumbest thing that they <laughs> ever did. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna live to regret this. Right? I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the regret. I don't see it. <laughs> Let's open it up for a few questions. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Did you have? Did you want to finish that? I can continue to talk. <laughs> about this. Let's open it up some questions. I'm sure you'll get a chance that to, to, to ask one there. Uh, Joe, if you could stand and introduce yourself, but if you would hold on a second until someone comes by with a microphone. Think down the center aisle. Thank you, George Bailey, Lebanese Information Center. So, um, by the way, I was in Lebanon before the the resignation, during, and after. So, like, I came back ten days ago, and I guess the, the first of all, I think we have to realize that the the anti Hezbollah elements are there, and and they're present. They're still committed, uh, but unfortunately, and here's here's where my questions will uh, uh, will develop. I guess. Unfortunately, these guys have been left out for the past 10 years. And if we, if we want to witness what happened in the first three years after the Syrian revolution, when they were fighting Hezbollah with the support of uh, Washington, etc., but they were the drivers behind the fight. They were getting killed, assassinated, and I can go on and on, and then invaded. And in 2008, and here might be the changing point, Tony, in 2008 when Hezbollah invaded Sunni Beirut and, uh, and the Druze Mountains, and the March 14 at the time elements went to Washington and to the Arab League and said, can someone help us? The LAF doesn't want to do anything. They said, no, you're on your own. And then Jumblat capitulated, and we can, and then Hariri soon afterwards, etc. So, so the question now is, when you ask these elements, you know, what are you waiting for? They said, well, we're waiting for a regional support. We're waiting for Washington to support us. For 10 years, the reality is, you heard it, I heard it in Washington, we want stability in Lebanon, and stability equals Hezbollah. We want Hezbollah to be part of the government. We don't want, I heard it, we do not want the LF to confront Hezbollah. Right. Yeah, so that was the request from Washington. Right. And possibly from Riyadh. So shouldn't the change start in Washington and Riyadh before we ask those Lebanese to stand up and then get slaughtered? Well, but it's interesting because you, you framed the question in terms of 2008, which is the moment of armed confrontation, not political confrontation, mm -hmm. armed confrontation between Hezbollah and the opponents of Hezbollah. So the logic of your question, it, it's not political, by the way. right, and the political, March 14 won all the political confrontation. They, they won in 2009, right after they won an election, right, because none of that matters, because like I said, we're not, it's not that they were playing by different rules, playing different, a different game altogether. Politics is not a factor in it. So if the issue is, where was US support? Where was US support at a time of a military confrontation? So the answer then has to be adequate to the military confrontation part. Now I ask you, who in Lebanon is going to actually be the group who is going to stand up and say, please give us military support so that we can do a military confrontation with Hezbollah? Not a single group in Lebanon is going to say that. Not one, right? Now, they're going to say the LAF, and then we enter into the realm of poetry again, right? Because they know, and there was, a, you, you tell me, this is, I, I saw one of the reports made a claim that when uh, the head of the Lebanese forces went to Riyadh and the Saudis asked him what would be the force that could stand up to Hezbollah, they asked, would the LAF be doing? And supposedly, the, the head of the Lebanese forces told them, you can forget about that because these guys are half with Hezbollah anyway. So if the instrument that people, you know, and you say that the LAF, I'm with you on Washington with the LAF policy. I'm saying it's a completely nonsensical policy. It should stop. It's, these guys are not going to confront Hezbollah. Why, why are we supporting them then as such? But the delusion that I want, I don't want us to return to the delusion of saying, uh, well, let's confront them politically, and then somehow things will turn out differently than what happened between 2005 and 2008. Because the political confrontation ended in 2008 in a military confrontation. 
a military confrontation that none of the Lebanese parties was equipped for, and none of them is willing to be equipped for. And I'm not even sure if it's a viable option for them to be equipped for, because you know, I mean, I don't know how that even would play out. So, if this is where, if this is the fault line, if this is where all the nonsense gets swept aside and we get serious, right? This is why I said there is no option for confrontation in Lebanon as such, because the Lebanese instruments themselves, who would be the instruments for, for such an option, are unwilling and incapable of pursuing it. If, if we are going to have a policy of confrontation, fine. I, you know, then U.S. support should be geared towards that, not towards fantasies about state institutions and the LAF. And Tony, I'm gonna, I'm, thanks. I'm just going to move on to another. Um, here, if you can hold on to Lori, just one second, and introduce yourself, please. Lori Milroy, Kurdistan 24. If I could ask two questions. One is for Mike, and it regards Kirkuk, and Kurdistan 24 followed very closely. And our understanding is that the United States actually gave a green light to the Iraqi government to attack the Kurds in Kirkuk because the administration <clears throat> believes that a one Iraq policy will contain Iran and that by attacking Kirkuk, the Iraqi prime minister would um, secure his reelection. So that was done kind of with the tacit permission of the United States. So what's your comment on that, if you understand that part? And my other question for whomever would like to answer it is, in Iraq now, and you've, Tony gives excellent um, account of how Iran infiltrates in these IRGC clones. Do you see the future of Iraq if things continue as they are now in the same way it will be Lebanon, say, a decade from now? Mike, why don't we start with you and then actually I, I ask Mohammed, because especially because of uh, the different engagements between Saudi officials and Iraq after a while. So I'm going to ask you to yeah, finish yeah. that. Well, my answer can be really short because I don't know the answer. I, I, I don't know exactly what the U.S. government said to the um, to, to Baghdad. Um, it's I, I, it, two, a couple of things are totally clear. One is that the U.S. government was against Barzani's initiative, and uh, and they felt that it was undercutting a body. And they do believe that building up a body is the answer to the. Uh, to the problem of, uh, of of Iran, but what they said to the Iran in general, the rise of Iranian power in general in Iraq, what they said specifically about the Kirkuk operation, I don't know. Mohammed, do you want to uh, sure. talk about um, your perception, also the Saudi perception? What are they trying to shape in Iraq? So, the way I see the Saudi perception of, of, of Iraq right now is they are committed to a unified Iraq, uh, and without with conditional investments are willing uh, 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 to come closer to the Iraqi government and, and, and look at ways uh, 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 to, to create a more independent Iraq that serves Iraqi interests. We've seen this with uh, numerous visits by Saudi officials to Iraq, Haid al-Abadi's visits to, to Saudi Arabia, Muqtad al-Sadr's visit to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, but take the file of, of, of uh, the issue of, of, of rebuilding and, and post uh, uh, ISIS, Mosul, and other areas in Iraq. Um, the Saudis seem very uh, uh, wary that they shouldn't be making the same mistakes as the past. You know, investment has to be contingent on political uh, action, on political developments. Uh, something like that is is possible in a country where uh, you know Iraq has has a military. Iraq, uh, there is potential for the Iraqi government uh, to exercise independence. In other areas in the Arab world, that 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 dynamic doesn't exist. Now, it's worth noting also that the Iraqi government has a vested interest in bringing in these popular mobilization units into uh, uh, the state-regulated uh, uh, military and the state uh, military institu uh, institutions, and it's uh, facing a lot of pushback by Iran for that reason. Iran doesn't want to lose support for uh, uh, independent Shia militias in Iraq that answer directly to the Revolutionary Guard. So that's a, a push and pull between the Iranians and the Iraqi government right now. Uh, that with caution, you know, uh, Iraq's Gulf partners are trying to support the government. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's get another question. 
And we can come down to Sinarana again. Shoshana, if you can stand up, I promise we'll, we'll, we'll go to this gentleman next. Okay, so just, just stay there. Thanks. Shoshana Bryan, Jewish Policy Center. Um, the elephant in the room is that the only military in the region capable of taking on Hezbollah is Israel. Tony mentioned there's no, there's no mechanism, there's no way to do it from inside Lebanon. No, there isn't, but there is Israel. So to go back to the idea of Saudi Arabia, the Saudi change in opinion about Israel all has to do with what it believes Israel will do against Iran. If that's the foundation for Saudi-Israel friendship, uh, do you see that playing out in Lebanon or in Syria? I don't. I don't think they can bring the Israelis in. Well, wh why don't we have everyone give a short, give a short answer to that? Because everyone has a take. They might be similar, but let's. Tony, why don't you start? Then Mohammed, then Mike, if you would. I don't think. I mean, I know people read a lot into this. The, the, so, I mean, what it does is, I think it's a function of what Mike said. It's it's a petition to Washington more than anything else. Now, it's an important thing because it puts uh, the Saudi assessment and the Israeli assessment about the reality of Lebanon in line with each other, right? They're in sync. But I'm not sure that the American position is in sync on this, right? I mean, the statements of the, the, of the, of the administration about the destabilization of Lebanon would preclude that. So that's number one. Number two, I don't see that necessarily as a, as a driver for the Israelis, because it doesn't alter anything for them. It doesn't alter the Israeli assessment of Lebanon. So it's not like they're a novelty that, that, that happened. They're, they are still waiting for Washington on the issue of Syria. So if anything is going to be, I think, with the exception perhaps of the building of missile factories inside Lebanon, which may not necessarily lead to a full-blown confrontation, but if for Israeli action in Lebanon, with the exception of that, I think the Israeli uh, attention right now is, is, is more Syria-oriented uh, as a result. So if it starts, it, the, the, the case is badly will start in, in Syria, perhaps, uh, and not necessarily in Lebanon at all. Ahmed, you want to? I think I would agree with, the, with, with Tony. Um, I don't see it in the cards that you know, attacking Hezbollah head on in Lebanon and, and repeating what happened in 2006 is something that, that people would like to see or something that's realistic going forward. Cutting the supply lines for Hezbollah that come through Syria and solving both problems at the same time uh, is something that's a little bit more uh, realistic. Uh, but the other part of the question, you know, uh, there is an alignment in, in interests, if you like, between Saudi Arabia and Israel. There is an alignment and assessments of regional conflicts, but that doesn't translate into active uh, cooperation, active uh, uh, unity. Uh, there is uh, that could uh, happen at, at at some point in time. There are certain uh, uh, officials and views from the Israeli side that black boxing the Palestinian issue is necessary and focusing on on building relationships with Arab countries uh, uh, w with the Palestinian issue aside is the way to go forward. But that that isn't being uh, accepted or entertained on 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 the Arab side. Um, and that's, that's, that's how I would answer. Mike, would you like to? Uh, I, I agree with my colleagues. OK. Um, this gentleman here, if you can stand and identify yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm John from American University. And thank you all right. for, uh, yeah. Oh, thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah, thank you all for coming and sharing your opinions on Lebanon, Saudi Arabia. But what my question is about is Syria. So you guys, uh, starting with Mike, and you guys seem to agree that Syria will probably be the center of the continued proxy war between the United States and Iran. And I think this is true. But my question comes into play on what you think the U.S. should be doing in Syria, mainly because the typical you know, U.S. style of intervention is functionally very difficult in Syria due to Russian and Iranian involvement and the high degree of that. So I was wondering what you guys would individually prescribe that's for good. U.S. Let's foreign policy everyone. in Syria. That's, that's good. And why? Okay, why don't, why don't we have everyone give a short answer to that. Mike, why don't you start since you, again, think that that's really the center of gravity. Right. I think that both you, both everyone kind of agrees, but... I, I think it's then. the center of gravity for the... I think there's a regional struggle for mastery going on, and, and, and it's the center of gravity for the Russians and the Iranians. This is their number one priority. I don't think it is the American priority uh, for a whole bunch of reasons I won't go into, but I, but I think that Syria is always kind of an afterthought for the, for the United States. I think it's because it is the struggle, for, it is the center of gravity of the regional contest, it should be our focus. And what we should do, uh, um, 
bearing in mind that there is um, a, uh, a desire on the left and the right in the United States not to intervene in Syria, right? I, I think that any, we have to be realistic about this. Any political leader is going to be very hesitant. I think the key is um, not, not to give more, you know, Tony said that the Iranians are lapping up territory. The Iranians and the Russians are lapping up territory. We should not give them any more. So the, uh, and maybe the principle should be block the land bridge, block the land bridge, block the land bridge. And the, the easiest way to do that is in the middle of Euphrates River Valley, Raqqa and so on, where we have a dominant presence. And as I read what American policy is right now, we're about to hand it back to the regime, which means to the Iranians and the Russians, right? Now, it's going to be, it's not going to be a direct handoff. It's going to be a two or three step process. And, the, and, and, and one other thing, I'll just, I could go on in detail about different things we could do in, in the middle of Euphrates River Valley, but another thing that you, I, I keep hearing European diplomats talking about uh, stabilization and reconstruction. And they and and they want to they want to funnel money into Syria, and the Russians and the Iranians will be glad to take all those euros, right? And then demand more. And I think that those euros should only go to areas that are under the American security umbrella. But in, in, in but to have that policy, you already have to have a different concept of Syria than we currently have because we got we've got one foot out the door right now. Tony. It's ma mainly along the same lines as as, uh, uh, as Mike. Uh, I think, with one exception, is that I would not constrain the American footprint or the uh, uh, in Syria to just what we have in eastern Syria. I think there's a misconception about people. Well, you know, you can't go in. Then you need to have an exit strategy. I mean, have you looked around Syria? The United States is everywhere around Syria. Right. It doesn't have to be in Syria. It is. In you mean the allies? Between the allies, you know, I mean, between the navy, between Israel, between Jordan, right. between Turkey, between. Right. I mean, you know, we had something in in, the, in Kurdistan regional government. I'm not sure how that how functional that is anymore. But but the idea is that you have different positions. That if the commitment, if the concept of th that this is what we need to do, and therefore everybody understands that we are in this game now. We're not just you know, talk to the Russians kind of approach. I think you don't really need to have that big of a footprint in Syria to be able to to, to destroy the land bridge and, and the Shiite militias that are extremely uh, overexposed in those areas. I mean, so, the, you know, it's a desert area, the idea that you can destroy them in a heartbeat. Can I, can I add one more sentence? I know you don't want me to. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to. You have his. I'm sentence. going to create facts on the ground. I'm he doesn't not even want his sentence. Permission. You want his sentence yeah. later. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Mohammed. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the other thing I would do is I. This is kind of an answer to Shoshana's question. I um, I would support the Israelis more. I forgot about that. Uh, uh, about the U.S. policy and and Israeli policy about the 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 movement of the Iranians southward should be in total sync, and that's somewhere where. We don't have to. We don't have to encourage the Israelis to go to war in Syria, but we just, we just, we just strongly support their actions in support of their red lines, and we make their red lines ours. That would be. That would be. That would be great. Yeah. Um, then their deterrence and our deterrence would reinforce, and we don't leave them. We don't leave them exposed before the Russians. Right. Um, Nadim, I think this is the last question. You can hold on and wait for the, wait for the microphone. I believe this will be the last question. I'll make it a very short one. Okay. Are the Americans and the Saudis on the same page in the region and in, in, in Lebanon? I'm sort of, my imagination is triggered by Mike's image of the fig leaf. If we remove that fig leaf, what do we see underneath? I mean, uh, I, don't, I think we'll discover that the United States is no longer the, the, the dominant power, that it has no role in Syria that it's not true that it doesn't have allies on the ground. It has allies on the ground who think that the United States abandons them every time, and the Kurds are the last example of that in Iraq, and the ones in Syria are about to discover this. So is that a, a something that the, the Saudis and the Americans are on? on Mohammed, it seems, you it seems to me that 
Yeah. American policy is only in sync with Russia and Iran. It's not in sync with any of its allies. That's what I mean. Mohammed, why don't you give that a shot first, and then we'll move down. I'd say maybe they're not on the same page, but at least now they're reading the same book. Uh, and that's not what is happening uh, under the Obama administration. Now, at least there is there is consensus on, on the general threat assessments uh, in the region, what needs to be fixed, who, who can fix it. Uh, tactically, how that's going to play out, you're right. Uh, that remains to be seen. There are many, many question marks. Tony? Well, no, I, I, in Lebanon, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think it's not, uh, th there is a general assessment that you know, Hezbollah and Iran aren't partners, which was what used to be the case. They're not. But at the same time, we're still holding on to a policy that clearly the, the Saudis just broke with. The idea that, that you can fix anything in Lebanon to be meaningful opposition to Hezbollah is, is out of the question. We're still holding on to that. And I think that, and that's where I, what I was saying earlier why I do think, forget whether you turn Lebanon into a theater or not, the investment, the US investment in the order is going to have detrimental effects uh, uh, on, on uh, our allies' ability to deal with it, but also it's going to have detrimental effects in that it's going to reinforce uh, the, the Iranian position region-wide. Well, what, be it the Saudis, be it the Israelis. I mean, in, in, uh, quite, uh, in, you know, the idea that the United States is saying, no, we don't want anything to happen here, whether economically or militarily or anything, right, or even politically for that matter. Uh, that, I think... Puts it, puts a puts a tension between the United States and its allies over uh, how to how to deal with Lebanon to move beyond this this idea of common threat assessment to an actual policy. Mike, if you'd like to, um... Um, so uh, an Israeli official told me um, was describing the difference between uh, working with the Obama administration and working with the Trump administration, and he said that. Under the Obama administration, we were, we were treated to a constant diet of hostility and resentment. And he said, with the Trump administration, we are, we are, um, we are contending with chaotic friendship. Right? And, and then he said, and chaotic friendship is better than hostility and resentment. And I, I think that that's, I think this sort of chaotic friendship is a better concept than, than the one that you suggested of, of we're actually supporting the, the Iranians and the, uh, um, in, in the, we're in sync with them. But it, it's, it's not, the, 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 it's very important to understand though, it's very important to understand though that the theology of the Trump administration is that they are working against the Iranians. They truly believe that, sincerely, right? They just have a lot of, the, the, the problem with American policy is all of the mid-level concepts. It's not the higher concepts, right? It's the mid-level concepts, like as Tony was suggesting, strengthen state institutions, right? We wanna, we're, the way we're going to push back against the Iranians is we're going to build up state institutions, right? And or we're, this is how we're going to get rid of uh, Sunni extremism, and then we'll build up state legitimacy in, in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. But all those states are under the thumb of the Iranians. So that's a little problem with, the, with this mid-level concept of pushing back, uh, of building up state, state institutions. But the goal, the result is that we get in sync with the Iranians, but the goal is not to be, um, the goal of the Trump administration, and the Obama administration, there was more of a question. But in the Trump administration, the, the goal is not to be in sync with the Iranians. It just so happens that we often find ourselves in sync with them. So let's, con let's, con let's continue this after. Nadim, I'm going I'm, I'm to gonna call it off, and you can continue the conversation after. In the meantime, I want to thank you all very much for coming. I want to thank Hudson Institute, and I want to thank uh, especially my three uh, excellent panelists. Thank, thank you, you guys very much. Thank you.